Hello, Chef Khan here. So today I am actually in Gulfport, Mississippi at my second home. And this is my kitchen where I totally enjoy cooking. So I thought, why don't I, rather than always be in Mackinac's kitchen, why don't I cook at my other kitchen, my, uh, my home kitchen, which is always fun because like for instance, tonight, I am cooking for a group of people. They're all my tango dance friends and they're gonna be practicing and dancing and I'm gonna be in the kitchen. Okay, I might do a little bit of dancing, but we're still working on that. But regardless, we're, it's a fun group. We, we get together whenever I'm in town, numerous times, and just do a lot of cooking. Not always just me, we have team efforts, but today it's me cooking gumbo. A great dish for a lot of people. Today I'm gonna do a seafood gumbo, but when I make gumbo years ago, I saw a recipe from Dookie Chase, which is a famous restaurant here, woman restaurant here in New Orleans. And she makes, at, I think it's Christmas Eve, she makes a green gumbo, uses a bunch of greens. So I'm gonna use her base, plus I'll use a shrimp base um, to have those two stocks to add to my gumbo. But I figure the green, which we'll be using, kale, carrot tops, watercress, spinach. That'll give my gumbo, first of all, tons of vitamins and a whole another health aspect. And it's always been one of my favorites. It, the green color comes out, it just looks awesome. So, as I was saying, we're gonna use carrot tops. And what I'm gonna do with the carrot tops is, I'm just gonna chop them up, to pull out some of the stems. But for the most part, it's gonna simmer in the stock and then I'm gonna blend it up afterwards. So some of the little stalks are just fine. And I am now gonna to just toss these. Wash the again just slightly, rinse them off. Won't be like spinach where I really have to go to town on cleaning. Drop those in my pot. This is my favorite kind of kale. This is elephant kale. A lot of times in the grocery store you'll see kind of the traditional kale that's kind of curly. That's, we don't generally say that's a culinary kale. It takes a ton of cooking and it tends to remain tough. This one, packed with vitamins and by far my favorite. So I just pull along the sides, same thing I do with collard greens. Just pull them up, the leaves away from the stem, toss the stem. That's this easy part of the prep. At the top, you know, it's more tender up there, or generally more tender. If a piece of stem is in there, totally fine. So I'm just gonna go ahead and keep pulling. I find that in the kitchen, not that I'm always in a hurry, but there's a lot to do. So I don't spend a ton of time making sure every little piece is off. It's easier for me just to get to it and get as much as I can. Quite clean, maybe not perfect. And then after this is my last one, I'll just chop it up just slightly and throw it also into the pot of water. I put about two quarts of water in there so it'll be kind of a nice green, full of vitamin pack stock. There we go again. And I'm using one of my favorite knives that I have here, my Mac. Favorite knife. So also cabbage. Slicing it up, little rough chop on it, toss it in the pot. I already trimmed the leaves, you know, find a cabbage you generally have to trim off, you know, three, four layers of it, just depending. This looked like real fresh local. It had quite a few big leaves on it. Let's see. So now the spinach. So again with the spinach, I got a big bunch. I took off most of the stems because I am gonna blend it up. As I said, I'm not too worried about the stems, but I am gonna place it into my colander and give it a good rinse. A lot of times you can feel the grit on it and you, you don't see that even on herbs a lot of times. You can feel the grit. See, I can feel a little bit under my fingers now, but this actually doesn't feel too bad. Sometimes you'll pull a leaf apart from another leaf and there'll be quite a bit of sand and dirt in it. So I'm just gonna move it around. If it felt dirty, I would almost go to every leaf and individually wash them. But I think with what I'm doing here, just moving them around, 
still be totally fine. I'm going to gently keep the water, the cold water running on it as I jump to my watercress. Watercress is an awesome green. If you have, you usually will come with a, the soil pack on it and you just cut away from where the dirt pack is. It's peppery, it's strong, but it will definitely add. Often when I do spinach, if I can find watercress, I put them in together. Just give it another flavor element to the greens. Now these I'm going to rinse off just slightly. Because the soil was at the bottom, I'm not worried about it being near the stems. I'm going to toss them into the pot. Gather the rest of my little bits on the board. There might be pot here going. So, see how our spinach is doing. It feels good. I see a big, a few big stems. I might just chop off a couple of those as I'm running it under the water. And water is running clean. Put it into my pot. So I'm gonna simmer the greens for about 30 minutes. Then I'll drain them, keep reserve the water again, my little veggie green stock for the gumbo on the toward the end. Next, I'm gonna add just for flavor into the greens, onion. Onions are wonderful for everything. Now I don't know if you've ever been taught or seen how to cut an onion, but it is the best way. Furry end, non-furry end. Slice off the non-furry end by so doing. And of course, the sharper the knife, the better. Now you have a flat surface. Cut it in half. So as the greens are simmering, I'm on to the shrimp part of my project. Because I, again, we're doing a seafood gumbo for the most part. I can put some sausage in there also but the shrimp are gonna be part of my stock. So I'm gonna make a separate shrimp stock. So what we use, since I already had my shrimp with the heads on, got them today in this wonderful market that I love shopping, which is in the neighborhood. So I spend about an hour there going through the aisles and getting a bunch of different products for the house. I found this shrimp in a big, had a big collection of them and I thought, put me onto my gumbo idea. So I'm gonna twist off the head because that's gonna be part of our stock and then the shell. So the two parts we have to do is, you know, get put the shell in for me to be able to brown up and then put the water in and get a little stock going. And then we have need to define the shrimp that we're going to be putting in the gumbo later, which I'll be putting the shrimp in and also some fish we're going to put in there too, which I'll be showing you. We'll put that in the very end, right before I head over to the other house where everybody's gathering and going to have fun dancing and eating. And maybe we're having a little something to drink there too. Funny side note, because I'm not at the restaurant cooking, I'm in, at home. It's always kind of fun you get to have like maybe a glass of wine while you're cooking. So I went into the refrigerator and I was here you know, two weeks or just over two weeks ago and there's some Chardonnay left in there. So I decided I might be okay still, a couple weeks and it actually is just fine. So have a little glass left over from previous visit. So here we go. We're good. I'm just twisting off the head. This is my little bowl here that I'm gonna put in the shells. And then I go to the bottom where the little legs are and just reach in there to the shell area and just kind of start twisting off the shell. So kind of twist off in sections. To me, that's just always been the easiest way for me to do it. So as the shell comes out, then of course I want the tail too. So that last little piece, I'm just gonna pull him gently and Oh, there's a little bit of tail that's left in there. And then the other tail goes with me. The shrimp will go with me, except first we must devein it. So you take the back, take a little paring knife, go right along the middle of his back, or I don't know if a shrimp would really be considering this a back, but this part of the meat. And as you look in there, you can see, and sometimes you won't see it, but there's a little intestinal tract there and it just lifts right out. So you just take your little paring knife and pull it right out. Clean as can be. I dip my little knife into my little glass and let's do another one. So again, oh, his little head's coming right off. Twist off his head. If we were eating crayfish or shrimp with the head on, 
you'd be doing the same thing with the cook shrimp. Just twist his head. A lot of times you'll suck out the, the goodness in the head. But if not, you'll just twist the head off and take off the shell. Do the same process, just we're doing it raw instead of cooked. So I will be able to use the shells. So we will again twist off its shell. Put it in my handy bowl before I put it in. I'll be um, warming them just slightly before I add water with a little bit of butter. I may put a little onion in that one too, but for the most part, just getting the whole shrimp goodness out of the shell. It's amazing how much flavor shells have. All right, deveining. Just like, it's not even a quarter of an inch down deep that you need to go. Probably about a, hardly an eighth. Reaching in, pulling it right out. Shrimp ready to roll. So I have about uh, 30 more to do. I'll go ahead and come back to you guys in just a little bit. I thought I'd show you how I find the easiest way to cut a green pepper. And since we are playing with the Trinity, green pepper is a big part of it. So I, I went ahead and I diced up the onions as I showed you to just a small dice. Now I notice I have a pretty good amount, over two cups. Celery, when you work with the Trinity, it's more onions than it is green pepper, more green pepper than celery. Now I could say two cups of onion to one cup of green pepper to half of a cup of celery. But when I cook, I don't follow all the rules. <laughs> I try to stay to basics to an extent, but I love a crunch. I love celery. Celery is an underutilized vegetable. So I have a good amount of celery. I have a, more than a cup. And green pepper, I already have a cup started and this will, is a huge, I may not use the whole thing. I might save it for another meal, but I'll use at least another half of this. So we'll have two full cups of green pepper. So the easiest way, take your knife, set your green pepper down and cut this ring. Just slide your knife, turn your green pepper so your knife has just gone through where the fruit is or the vegetable, so to speak. And just pull that right off. Now there's still some usable part on here. Keep the seeds intact. And then I go ahead and just slice off that two good looking green parts. And then toss that. Now I'm gonna get take off the other end same thing, just cut right through it. So all those little kind of odd shaped pieces are there. I'll just chop those up or those are always good to nibble on when you're cooking, especially when you have raw vegetables around you. It never hurts to pop some in your mouth and, and that way you don't have to worry about the funny shapes. So I have both ends open basically. So I'm gonna cut through one piece of it. I'm gonna slide my knife into where I just cut through and see if you can see that. I'm gonna where there's the white pith area. I'm gonna just cut under all that, all the way, just sliding my knife and lifting as I slide under it, lift those, that part, which is quite bitter if you wanna say one part of this is more bitter. So then that piece of unused, well, I'm not gonna use it. It's not technically unusable, but it's not as pretty. So now I have this nice whole piece. Now I'm not gonna sit there and it's funny and it's round and it's kind of jumping around so I'm going to just cut that in half. Now I have a nice fairly flat piece that I'm going to cut in just little quarter inch julians or little sticks if you want to just use a non-culinary term. So I just made a bunch of the little sticks. Line them up. Let me face you guys that way. And I'm just going to go another quarter inch, chop it through. And there you have a bunch of just nice uniform pieces that I'm gonna to add to my little bowl here. So I'm gonna save this piece for another bead, like I said, but I do have all these little scrap pieces that I'm just gonna chop up. Now, chopping. You'll see people that they're doing a rock, rocking method where there's kind of rocking the knife, or you might see just cutting through it. I love both ways. So I might randomly do it one way for a while and switch up and do the other way. Knife work, a lot of products are come to you already chopped in a bag. 
to me that takes so much of the part of cooking that I love out of, out of it. So to me, chopping an onion every day is meaningful <laughs> and chopping anything else. I love the whole prepping part of the meal prep preparation. So I have nice little chops of the rest of my green pepper, which I'm gonna add to my bowl. So the Trinity is ready. Before we go on to cook this though, I'm gonna turn this toward the stove. And I wish you guys could smell what how the greens smell, but they look beautiful. They're fully nice and green. The pot just smells wonderful. The next to it, I have my shrimp pot going. I put about four cups. I browned the shells and I got them golden, reddish. And I put about four cups, no more than four cups of water on top of it. And I'm just letting both of these continue on for the shrimp at least another 20 minutes and the greens, they're about there. What I'm gonna show you next is we're gonna make the roux. And I'm gonna get it started. I don't know how long, much of the process I'll do on camera, but you'll get the idea of how, how to play with a roux. And so roux is another part of Southern and, and Cajun grill cooking. It's, uh, it's flavor, it's a thickener. But more than anything, I think to me, it, it means flavor. Let me just adjust my stove here a little bit. That's my pack. Nope. So I have my roux on. And what I did, so roux can be oil and flour. It can be butter and flour. It can be bacon fat and flour. When I do use butter, which I probably do more often than the other two, you just have to be very careful with it that your heat isn't too high. Um, there's a couple of schools of thought on making roux but from what I feel that I've done often enough is that medium heat is best. You know, some cooks will put it up at a higher heat. I, I love, again, like I like chopping, I love stirring. So I enjoy this whole process of roux. It's a lot like making a risotto. It's a lot of stirring, but there's something very zen about that whole part of it. So I, I today made for breakfast, we had a little bacon going on, so I, Took the bacon fat or kept it aside and i am using all three there's a little oil there's some butter and there's bacon fat pretty much even amounts of each the total amount is just over or just under a cup i'd say and you it's basically the same amount of flour to your oil or fat product so we are going to add the flour which is about a cup i don't get quite all of it right now and see how it feels. A lot of things are by looks. So we're not making a thick paste. It's, you want it to have some liquidy to it. it. The easier, the more liquidy, the easier it is. You don't have to maybe babysit it as much even though you really should. So I added that whole amount. And if you can see here, as I'm stirring it in to incorporate the lumps are gonna go away. It's, eh, it's thick, but not completely. The color right now is kind of a, just a brown, a very light brown. Depending, if I'm doing a, like an alligator pecan dish, I would make it very dark. So your colors on roux, um, a lot of schools of thought on that. Usually chocolate to kind of a light chocolate, you know, or dark peanut butter. I think it's dark peanut butter for me is my way of recognizing where I want to go with it. I never get it quite to the chocolate dark color. Um, I might lose a little bit of interest by that point because it does take, this will take me about 15 minutes. And so I'm going to be just stirring it and the color will develop. The color won't even probably start developing for almost 10 minutes. And I'll just continue to watch my heat, try to keep it at a medium. I'm not working on a gas stove, so it's, it is different and I have to kind of keep adjusting and keep an eye on everything differently than I might on my gas stove that I cook on all the time. So I will just be stirring away for a good 20 minutes. Uh, when the roux is finished, I'll kind of give you a look at what color I was seeking, you know, the dark peanut butter-ish color. Another uh, little piece of what we're doing is I am working today. We're gonna have okra because okra most people will say that it's not gumbo if it doesn't have okra. Okay, that's not, not totally true. I've had 
Gumbo many times at various places that didn't include okra, but I do love okra. Now some of the folks who I'm cooking for tonight don't. So I'm gonna cook my okra separately toward the end when I have some liquid for my gumbo oil. I'll just cook a little pot with my okra and then the people who love okra or like it can put it in their gumbo separately when once we get to that dinner part of the whole event. Before I do put the okra into a base of some, you know, my gumbo base, I'm going to fry it in a nice medium high pan with a little bit of oil. And because it's fresh and it's beautiful looking, I'm so excited. I may chop it, I may keep it whole. I, a lot of uh, Indian Pakistani dishes that I cook, keep it whole. Usually you'll find in gumbo, of course, it's gonna be chopped up or you know, sliced up. I'm not sure how I'm doing it yet, but I am gonna fry it for, and it's gonna take probably about five minutes. And what that does is it takes away that kind of, I don't think slime is the right word, but okra, do, okra does release uh, kind of a heavy gunk probably not a very culinary term, but it does release that, which actually is part of how it helps thicken something like gumbo where you may not even have had to use a roux. But since I'm not technically putting gumbo or putting the okra in it, I am using a roux. So that'll be something I do a little bit later before we head over to the other house. But I do want to make sure I did include okra for all of us that do enjoy it. So I will continue stirring and I'll show you the color I'm aiming for in just a, just a little bit. So, roux is finished. If you can see there, it's pretty brown. I think I got even darker than peanut butter. I, I didn't get to chocolate because I just don't. So I'm gonna put the roux into my bigger pot here. And then I'm gonna start with the onions. Many times you'll see a recipe that you're throwing the whole trinity together, the green pepper, the celery, the onion. I always start almost in all my cooking doing the onion first. A lot of cooking, the method is to get it nice and brown, caramelized. Um, if you're going French, of course, yeah, we're talking about sweating. Maybe at that point, if I'm doing more of that traditional cooking, I may put them all together and sweat them up, but still the onion as it cooks and as, as it caramelizes, it becomes even more flavorful. Whole different element. So, I'm gonna add my onion, stir the roux. I'm gonna let the onion cook for probably about three or four minutes. And I'm gonna turn my heat. It has been interesting cooking on this stove. I'll be lifting my pot every once in a while because the burner kind of does this little thing where it gets real hot and it kind of goes down a little bit and goes back and forth. So every oven is, our heavy stove oven is different. So it's always a challenge to cooking. It's not always so it's straightforward as you would like. So my onion, if you can see it now, it's just kind of filled up with the roux and it's gonna cook, sweat. I'm not gonna brown it, but I'm gonna get it farther along than then I'll add the celery and the green pepper. And we saute those up for you know, a good amount of time. At that point, I'll start putting in my garlic and putting in my seasonings. Hmm, seasonings, speaking of. So, what am I gonna use? You know, paprika is one of the major things that you would use. Um, I found in the cupboard here, not mine, but it's a Creole seasoning, salty, a little bit salty, so it has a salt element to it. So I will definitely put it before I put my salt, you know, then I add my salt toward the end. I have definitely need your pepper. So I have a fun little collection of all the different peppers. I'll be adding tomato. And I'll probably add, so I have my Italian spice done by Ohio Valley Chef Products. Ed Lintock, a good chef buddy of mine, does all my spices. And, you know, he puts me on the label. That's awesome, too. Having a little uh, thyme in it, a little basil, that's just going to kind of up the flavor for me. A lot of times I, I often cook in my mind. Um, I, I people do that. And I'm just looking for something that's going to be flavorful. And I wasn't finding a lot of what I might be using here in the cabinet. So 
hence why I'm going to use Italian herb, just a little to start with. I'll be using a little bit of Louisiana hot sauce. So I have some non-spicy eaters, so I'm going to keep the gumbo quite mild. So I'm, as I'm cooking the onion, I'm going to let it sit here just a bit, and I'm going to go on to chop up the garlic. So I'm using a whole head of garlic. I'm just uh, peeling, I was doing a little bit of this earlier in between stirring the roux and running away for a second and doing a little garlic. You really do have to babysit the roux, so I, I didn't have a lot of time. But um, So the whole head of garlic separated my little cloves. Often people, you see people, they wanna smash the garlic, which kind of helps this little papery uh, peel come off. What you do is you take this part of your knife, your, and I, I'll, I'll use both. I'll use the part of the handle or the part of this part of the knife, but take your part of your handle, it's nice and firm. Just press down on it, and it will smash it just a little bit. And then you can take the little feathery little paper part of the clove off. So I have about nine cloves. I probably could have done more. Garlic is pretty important. I'm just going to chop this up really fast here. Give my roux a stir. My onions are definitely starting to sweat now. Give them another, we'll give them another minute and then I'll add the celery and the green pepper. And then I'll be adding the garlic, sauteing all that up. I did go ahead and keep my okra whole put it in the oil and cooked it off slightly. And then I'm thinking, I could put, I could actually put it in the gumbo and if people who didn't like it could just, it's nice and big, take it right out. But I'll keep it separate. So I'll continue on doing a little chopping, doing a little stirring with my celery and my green pepper and get to seasoning and we'll all come back and gather because I have this awesome red snapper whole fish that I grabbed today. And I have a yellowtail snapper too. So I'm not sure if I'm using both, but the red snapper is large and we'll do a little filleting of that. You can watch me do that. And when the shrimp and the fish go in at the very end, I'll pot will be warm, ready to roll and put it in the car and head over to the other house. So we'll be back in just a bit for the fish. All right, we are at the point where the vegetables have sauteed for a little while. Uh, you know, actually only like four or five minutes. I'm gonna add my second bay leaf, nice fresh bay leaf, to enhance and get the oils out of your bay leaf. If they're dry, you can just give it a little crunch, but uh, do a little cuts in it, and that'll help release the oils and add more flavor. So the bay is in, or two of them actually. Now I'm gonna add my sh shrimp stock, which had, had its good 30 minutes or so. So I'm gonna get, strain that. I am missing one of my little, or not having here, a little net strainer that I love and use all the time, but colander will work. So, shrimp stock went in. I also have, I grabbed some sausages, kind of a fun different brand that I'm not familiar with, but Cajun sausages. So I wanna have a little smoky flavor even if it is seafood, I'll still have the smoky going on. And here is all the greens. Blended them up, and they are gonna make this gumbo very green. So, that was, that was a good amount. And then I have some of my cooking liquid from the greens. Now my pot's getting pretty full. Of course, I have like eight, nine people to feed. I may be able to find a bigger pot, who knows. <laughs> we'll just see how this goes right now. As I, so the tomatoes were added also when I was sauteing the veg, the paprika, the little Italian herb, a lot of pepper, a little bit of the, the crystal. And I'll just kind of keep adding that as it cooks to see if I'm at a level where it's people who don't like spice don't notice it exactly, they, just a little hint of it. And I'm sure we'll have more on the table for those who want to add more. So I'm gonna go ahead and let this just simmer now and gather flavor 
I'm not leaving for another hour, so until we leave, this is gonna continue on. And then we'll add the shrimp five minutes before I leave, the fish five minutes right before I leave, and we'll add those to it. So right now we'll go ahead and fillet the fish. A fun fact when cooking with Chef Khan, this is what I do. I think of these things in my head as I kind of spoke on a little bit earlier, but I was in the refrigerator grabbing my beautiful big snapper out and I saw this Terrapin Ridge Farms hot pepper berry bacon jam. Now, saw this, bought it last month and have used it in a couple things and it just has an awesome flavor. I mean, you could put it on cheese, on cream cheese. I don't know, I'm thinking, I think I did something with a red sauce um, last month and I put it in there just to give it a, another kick and hint of flavor. And I was looking at, you know, bacon, jam. I, don't, I can't find any brown sugar. Usually if I use a tomato element of any sort, I'm gonna put a little sugar in, a little honey. So since I didn't find a sweetener here in the house, I'm gonna use this bacon jam. And there's probably half cup left. So not gonna use a half cup, but I'm definitely gonna put a, like two, maybe three tablespoons. And you're, one's totally gonna notice it. I mean, they're gonna notice like, wow, what is this? This tastes very interesting. That's what I love to teach, is never be afraid to be creative, be adventurous. I mean, that's who I am by nature. And you know, looking in your refrigerator, that condiment drawer or part of the door in your refrigerator is full of little gifts of things you can use. Uh, years ago, when I would make marinara's or make a spaghetti, I'd put my blue cheese, some blue cheese dressing that I had in the refrigerator and um, did that forever. I don't do it anymore just because I kind of forgot about it, but um, maybe because I'm not at home cooking. But anyway, that is just a little tidbit I wanted to share with you is never be afraid, look around. Very seldom would do you hurt anything you're cooking. You know, if you can kind of taste or take a taste of something and say, hmm, that tastes kind of cool. Would that match with that? And usually your brain's pretty good about saying, yay, yeah, maybe. Yeah, any, any of those answers, go for it. So I will be adding this. Now, I thought for fun on camera, it'd be fun to play the fish. So I shall do that. And then I'll be cutting up a little hunk, you know, it's probably the same size as a shrimp. So, you know, nice big, two inch or one and a half inch pieces of fish that we'll, we'll be cooking off at the very end. I do want to show you the gumbo though. It is looking beautifully awesome. Nice and green with all those herbs. So not only green, but healthy. So I fillet art char all the time. So I, Usually their mouths open very easily and I kind of just stick my finger up in their mouth. But this little guy has a very tight mouth and really sharp teeth. So I'm not going to do that. I'll instead reach under his little gill area and just use that for a handle. So under the gills, under this little wing, angle your knife toward his head. Make your cut through there. That's where his little bones are, where the cheeks are, back behind there. So, also, I'm in the house here, I don't have a fillet knife. A fish fillet knife is hopefully nice and very sharp, very thin, and also it's a little more flexible. This is a little firm and obviously quite wide, but it is sharp, so we will make do. I'm gonna turn my okra off a moment. I have it cooking in a little bit of the green stock, so it'll be perfect for all of, those of us who want these. So, struggling just a little bit here. I know my knife is sharp, so it shall be fine. Just a little bit on that little one there. So what you do is you, I'm angling it now, I'm gonna angle it back and go along the rib of the backbone. So just kind of keeping right above the back, Bone. And there's the bones going down the center. And those who've worked with Snapper, it is much more bony than I have to deal with with my char. So I'm just going to pull the meat up a little bit. And 
watch it go. I'm trying to angle down just slightly so I'm not losing flesh. It's kind of a little fine line because if you angle too far, then you're just gonna be struggling with the bones. And slide and there you are. Then we have a nice little piece of filet. Cut away those parts of the bones and pin bone it, get the bones out, cut it into nice, nice little chunks. And before we leave, we'll be putting it in the pot. So thank you for spending time making gumbo with me here in Mississippi. And I shall see you another time.